In these practices, we should be disgusted but not surprised that Metro's employees have faced disproportionate risk of fatality and injury as they work to keep the Metro system safe for the rest of us. No fewer than eight Metro right-of-way workers have been killed on the job since 2005. It's an inexcusable record. Regarding the um, Tri-State Oversight Authority, I see my time has elapsed. I'm going to try and move through this quickly. Uh, we have a number of, of uh, recommendations that really apply to getting the necessary authority, staying on top of, of uh, open corrective action plans. Talk was tracking over 200 open corrective action plans designed to pretend, pre prevent the recurrence of accidents at one time. Some of those corrective action plans date back to 2004. Now, I noted with interest the announcement that Governor McDonald, Governor O'Malley, and Mayor Fenty issued just yesterday on these matters. I should say the talk has until May 4th to formally respond to the specific findings of our audit. Uh, the white paper that they released yesterday responds to some of our audit findings, but not all of them. I believe yesterday's announcement granting greater authority to the talk chairman and implementing efforts to streamline the talk's procedures are an important step in the right direction. More needs to be done, and, and is, as is always the case, the proof will be in the agency's performance. The same can be said for Metro's newfound responsiveness to the talk's safety concerns. I have known Rich Sarles for a number of years, going back to his service both at Amtrak and at New Jersey Transit. I believe he is a skilled and committed no-nonsense transit professional. But as Rich Sarles knows better than anyone, the proof that change has really come to Washington Metro will be in Metro's performance. Now, I, I was going to take some time and explain how our transit safety proposal addresses some of the very issues that we've um, found at Metro in the talk. I think I'll, I'll seek to do that through Q&A since I've expired uh, my time. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to, to appear before you this morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rogoff, and thank you uh, for that testimony. Uh, let me just pick up on uh, the issue you raised near the end of your testimony with respect to uh, tox proposal uh, that was made to the three, uh, the, the governors and the mayor uh, of the District of Columbia yesterday. Uh, I gather from your comments you've had some opportunity to, re to review that. We got it last and night. You, yes. you mentioned it, it went, it, it made some progress uh, toward some of the recommendations that you've raised, but still has some room to go. If you could please elaborate uh, both on the parts that you think address some of the issues that you've raised, but also on what you see as missing, it, which will have to be filled in uh, by the May deadline that you mentioned. Probably the most important uh, change that was made has to do with the actual authority of the individuals that are, that are appointed by the three jurisdictions. Up until this point, really, the talk was uh, Ms. Norton referred to it as toothless. I think it, it's, it's fair to say that th their authority and, and their ability to command any attention out of Metro is, is undermined by the law, but it's also undermined that whenever they sought to elevate an issue, they each had to go back to their own jurisdiction and consult with the district leadership, the Maryland leadership, the Virginia leadership, and get a go-ahead to elevate these issues. Uh, from what I could review, just having reviewed their document last night, they're, they're attempting to take on that issue by, A, appointing uh, a full-time chairman. As I pointed out, right now they had, up until recently, they had no full-time employees. To give uh, the talk greater authority to act independently without having to run everything up the flagpole in all three jurisdictions. But like I said, uh, how much uh, credibility and how much authority that the, the, the talk can have to address some of the core issues is undermined uh, by the statutes, both in terms of the authority that was granted to talk and, and the absence of federal standards. Well, on that, on that issue, you've, you've mentioned in your testimony uh, that only a few states uh, have developed comprehensive state-level uh, regulations and granted uh, their state safety organizations uh, the authority to enforce uh, those regulations. Could you, you talk about what uh, those states have with respect to the enforcement uh, provisions and then talk a little bit about uh, modeling TOC after that and, and what changes would be required specifically uh, to the, the legal framework to accomplish that? Well, under the legislation we've submitted, our goal is to develop a system where the state safety organizations are very much our partners. We want to strengthen the state safety organizations just like Mr. Micah does. We want them to be our partners in this endeavor. Uh, but in order to do that, 
they need to have the authority to, co to command the attention of the agencies they oversee. Uh, and, and some of those authority agencies that, that some of the states have, have implemented piecemeal have been things like the ability to fine, the, the, the ability in a worst case scenario to dictate an operating practice. Those aren't, those aren't the common situations that you want. You certainly don't want, you know, we, we, first and foremost, transit agencies have transportation to deliver during rush hour and they need to get people in and out and, 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 and it needs to be done in a seamless fashion. But I think importantly, right now, we have 27 state safety organizations. Uh, all of them uh, I would describe as, as weak in their authority. But more importantly, since we have no federal standards, we have 27 different definitions of rail safety out there. And that's one of the reasons why we felt it was critically important that there, there be an opportunity for the federal government to establish minimum safety standards. So as we strengthen the state safety organizations, they, they have a standard to, to oversee and enforce rather than 27 agencies defining safety in their own way. Uh, well, MATA, as, as you probably know, has also come up with a, a kind of work plan uh, to respond to uh, the issues that you raised in your report. Uh, can, you, can you comment on whether uh, that plan, in your opinion, uh, gets us to where you think we need to go to meet the safety concerns that you raised? Well, well we haven't reviewed the, you know, we haven't uh, had transmitted to us a comprehensive plan yet. Um, like I said, they have till the 4th to specifically respond to the findings of our audit. Um, we've obviously seen measures taken by Metro, uh, some of which we find very encouraging. They have now brought in a new chief safety officer in Jim Doherty, uh, who is a, who's a, who's a industry professional uh, um, who came out from California to join the WMATA team. Um, we've obviously seen uh, hiring now. Uh, we were very concerned about the number of vacancies in the safety office. I think one of the things that's very, very hard to determine from the outside uh, is whether this whole issue of communication has yet been solved, is whether all of the assorted stovepipes in WMATA are working together, are talking to each other, and, and pooling resources around common safety goals. And there, I think the, the, the proof, as I said, is going to be in the performance. Okay. Thank, thank you. Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, one of the things we try to do here is, is, is ask different questions to make the record complete. And I'm going to ask you a line of questioning that uh, is almost counter to uh, the Secretary's proposal or portions of it, but not because I want to be counter to it. His proposal in the Committee of Jurisdiction may be exactly right, but I'll leave that to the Transportation Committee. But let me ask you a couple of questions. First of all, what if you set up a standard and, and, didn't, uh, and didn't have the authority to enforce it, but you set up a standard and published it? What if you had the funds to publish a central standard and you had the transparency to review whether or not they were compliant with what would ultimately be a voluntary standard, wouldn't that, first of all, set something from which these committees, and this appears, the metro system appears to be a committee of committees of committees, and that's part of their problem, but ultimately the committee would have to answer the question, are we compliant or not? Uh, the same as every audit firm looks at, and I sit on the board of a public company, we look, we look and, and, you know, the one thing we don't want is we don't want our review to say we have material failures of our audit uh, in, in any aspect. So we work very hard to meet that standard. We don't always meet it, but ultimately you can have material failures every single time as a public company, and yet the last thing you want to do is have the stockholders, particularly in a public company, see that. What is wrong with the federal government beefing up its transparency and its ability to develop that standard as an interim step? Well, there are some voluntary standards in place now. They are not issued by the FTA. They are, uh, I will say that we have um, participated in funding this effort through the American Public Transit uh, Association, but they are just that. They are voluntary Does the metro system meet that standard? Uh, I can't speak to each individual voluntary standard and where, me where metro, uh, metro may be compliant with some and not with others. I, I think But doesn't that beg the question of if you have helped in the process of creating multiple standards with your own funding, in a sense, aren't you complicit, if you will, in this failure by not using the federal government's dollars 
not just the ones we give to the various metros, but the Federal Government's dollars to have a single point of what is right or wrong in a given situation that could be studied and hopefully complied with by people who don't want to be sued, who don't want to look terrible in their safety record in other parts when, in some cases, some of these boards and commissions are either truly voluntary or de minimis in their pay. I mean, people who sit on these boards often, the last thing they want is to ruin a reputation that caused them to be appointed by a mayor or a governor to them. Uh, I think to the degree that we're, we're, we're complicit in wrongdoing, and that is that, and, and this started obviously before our participation, but that is that we engaged in at least helping the transit industry develop voluntary standards. As a federal agency, I feel that it's our obligation to identify what the safe practice is, and that is why the only way we can ensure that we're going to see those safe practices is by having mandatory standards. Now, having said that, well, let, 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 me, me make let me be the devil's advocate a little further. You haven't developed a single standard. You haven't had the ability. Sir, to sir I'm prohibited by law from. No, no, no. I understand. Standard. I understand. But I'm trying to walk you through the difference between federalism and, and in fact, a single government. We don't have a single government. Uh, the uh, San Diego has a pitiful, slow system of, of metro for the most part. Most of our trains and trolleys and so on, and for that matter, the San Francisco uh, cable cars, I think, should flunk any safety standard, and yet. Please, let's not tell San Francisco that they have to give it to their cable cars. So back to the basic point. You haven't developed a single standard. For whatever reason, call it a self-inflicted wound by Congress, you haven't developed a single standard. You don't have uh, a statutory transparency, even though we provide more than 30 percent of the funding to the metro system. And uh, you, if you will, you've, been, you've sort of been an observer. If, if we're looking at fixing the system, and respecting states and, and other, in this case, a three, three, uh, two state and, a, and the district uh, organization, respecting their ability to do the best they can with the specifics of what they have, why wouldn't we take the interim step of giving you the authority to, to, to analyze, the money to analyze, the ability to have transparency on these organizations that we fund with federal taxpayer dollars, but at the same time, recognize that until you produce that standard that you'd like to produce and it has a little bit of testing, why would we immediately go to mandating it when it might be in some cases that your standard, if mandated, would not necessarily improve the safety for every metro around the country? After all, you do have authority over the interstate train system and it is not without its flaws, is it? Uh, no, it certainly isn't. I mean, I, I, let, let me make three points. Um, the interstate train system is overseen by the Federal Railroad Administration, and it's very pertinent to some of the data that Mr. Micah put up, and that is that we have a very voluminous federal book of standards issued by the Federal Railroad Administration that, participa that, that pertains to about one-eighth of the, the rail transit riders in the form of commuter rail. Uh, eight times that number of, 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 of transit riders are currently covered by no federal standards. Now, I think it's important to point out, you're talking about a specific span standard to a specific technology. We have said over and over again that it is our goal to not recreate the, the very voluminous FRA rule book for rail transit systems. Not only would it be overwhelmingly burdensome, it wouldn't really be appropriate for rail transit because these systems use different technologies. You can't just write a standard that would necessarily apply to all of them. I mean, certainly you could, you could pull off some low-hanging low fruit, like prohibiting texting while driving a rail vehicle. That's or sleeping. Ki that's kind of, or sleeping. That's a no-brainer. Or, you know, medical, uh, medical examinations for rail transit vehicle operators. But our real goal is to require a system, to, 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 to get the transit operators to have a system of, of safety management in place. Right now, across the universe of rail transit safety uh, uh, performance by our transit agencies, we have huge diversity uh, in the area of asset management. And are they, uh, do they really know the condition of their assets? I have transit agencies that ha do a very, very good job who know where all their assets are and know their condition. I also have transit agencies who couldn't even tell you where all their assets are at this moment and everything in between. And what we're trying to do is not not necessarily regulate in, in, in the tensile strength of every segment of rail, 
but really get at the issue of requiring a safety management system that addresses the unique safety challenges of, all of each transit system. And the safety challenges of those transit systems are going to be different system to system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, the safety standards are going to be different system to system. That's very important. Most of these systems don't run across state lines the, w the way ours do. But uh, it's important to note, uh, because the, um, uh, Mr. Micah indicated uh, that there might be local systems that are doing well. And as I understand the administration's proposal, um, the the preference is for the local system. If it is not doing well, somebody's got to do it. And as long as it's done under federal, some, some federal regulations that we all would agree upon, th who would in fact be doing it would be the local jurisdictions. Isn't that the case? That rather than have mandates imposed because San Francisco differs from the District of Columbia, the mandates wouldn't be imposed locally. So you would look only at the mandates to see if they are consistent with safety standards, recognizing that there might be very different mandates and that the federal government shouldn't be imposing some national mandate. Our, our goal is, is really, I'm not going to say at the 10,000 foot level, but to establish standards at the 5,000 foot level, like I said, that addresses safety management systems rather than individual components agency by agency. I think importantly, another part of our proposal that's, that's critical to it, and that is, is to strengthen these state agencies. Right now, uh, and up until this year when the number just ticked above one, Right now, the average staffing strength for these state safety organizations when you remove California is less than one person per year. The it, average what? The, the, the staffing strength, uh, the number of people who actually work in these state safety organizations. Right now, based on our most recent data, because the talk has, has boosted his staff a little bit, and because California has a very different regime, but when you look at all of the other 25 state agencies, there's less than one full-time person working well, at them th all this year. This really gets to my next question, because I wanted a comparison of TUC with safety organizations across the United States. We, we know how to compare WMATA with uh, New York and Chicago, but are you telling me that vast systems in, in Chicago, for example, in Illinois, that those systems like WMATA would only have this toothless notion, would they have, or, or let me ask further, would such systems at least have some authority, even if they were not well staffed, in other jurisdictions? Our goal under our legislation no, is I'm to asking what it is in other is I'm now? trying to get some perspective on, on whether or not TOC is different from other jurisdictions. Well, I, I think if we have 20... In terms of its authority relative to the local transit system. We have state agencies that are stronger and state agencies that are weaker. We have 27 models out there, which is part of the problem, which is why we want to establish. But if they have one person on the average per person, can you possibly one. have some that are strong with one person now? Uh, the only one that I'd identify as being considerably stronger is California. It's handled by the California Public Utility Commission. They have staffing of upwards of 18 people to bring to bear on, on, on this issue. Well, do you think that one full-time chairman, and I'm told this chairman would be full-time, full this, this proposal that apparently came forward because this committee was holding a hearing, it, it appears. Would this full-time chairman be a full-time paid chairman at the executive level uh, as, as you understand it or see it? I, I, I've, I'm really just going off of, of, of the material we got last night. And that it might, does not say what? The, 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 the chairman of the talk is testifying on the next panel. It might be an appropriate question for him. I mean, what we've said is these are some ste steps in the right direction, but clearly more needs to be done. Let me ask you about your role. Um, how many other transit systems in the United States cross state lines like this? Here we cross three state lines. I, I, is that unusual? I probably want to, well, it is. It's unusual in some cases, but we, you know, just off the top of my head, we certainly have um, uh, up in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut region, we have it. We, we're going to have rail transportation between Rhode Island had, and Massachusetts. I know New York and New Jersey, and I, but right. typically they're within state, state boundaries. Typically. Now, in New York, and, uh, and you did an audit. What gave you the authority to do the audit at all if you have so little authority? 
over state systems? We had the authority to audit the state safety organization because they are the actor uh, that is, that is um, currently implementing the, the, the rather weak federal regime. That, that was the decision that was made in ICE-T in 91, that rather than have federal authority, that we would have these state safety organizations. How many audits have been done? Very few. We, we, so I, well, let me rephrase that. We, do in, we audit every three years the condition of each of the state safety organizations, but it's fair to say that this audit um, had considerably more attention and, and, and more resources put on it. Are you prepared, um, as I understand it and you are correct, we will learn more about what is proposed, uh, and you do not have the response to the audit yet. Is the federal government, uh, considering that three states are involved, the nation's capital involved, is your office prepared uh, to retain some kind of, over, of audit oversight until we get a, 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 a talk in place that will assure the public that safety concerns are being enforced? Or how will we know if there isn't somebody to inform us on a regular basis that what happened in June will not happen here or elsewhere? Well, I, th I, I think, you know, put simply, we can stay on top of the talk to implement the audit findings we have. But our entire reason for putting forward a new legislative statutory regime was precisely because we don't think the current law allows the kind of comprehensive oversight that by which we could guarantee the safety Mr. of the system. Mr. Chairman, could I just ask one last question? Does the, does the proposal put forward by the executives propose to change their laws? What, what about their laws would have to be changed for us to get an independent talk? Uh, well, you, you raised a very important issue, and that is independence. That is one of our concerns about, about the inadequacy of the current regime. We currently have a situation where some of these state safety org oversight organizations have been allowed to be funded by the very transit agencies they are supposed to oversee. It is a... Well, who else is how they're going to else get some money? Well, that's, that's, probably how, that's, that's probably how this situation emerged, but the reality is we don't allow regulated parties to fund their regulators in any other area of transit safety So oversight. among the things the state legislature would do, would have them funded from the legislature uh, rather than, and, 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 and essentially to strengthen their independence. Strengthen their independence and their enforcement authority. Thank you, Mr. Th Chairman. Th thank you. Uh, Mr. Michael. Well, thank you. Um, well, I think we're all searching for a solution to come up with the safest possible system. Our minority side did a report December of 2009 with some conclusions that uh, uh, for, for reform. My concern, Mr. Rogoff, is that uh, first, the, um, well, you're asking for $29.6 million and 260 new full-time permanent positions. And I'm wondering how that money would best be spent. You know, we've, we have, if, you, if we look at some of the problems, well, first, first you have some aging infrastructure. I just got back yesterday with Mr. Oberstar. We're out in Chicago. Right. The L was built in 1888, uh, the L uh, line. Um, the, um, we have a system here that's 34 years old. We look at the problems with the, that we've seen. We had, first of all, we, we had, well, well, we do have some special authority and responsibility over the district, which is unique, and we, we, we need to see that things are in place there. As far as the country, um, we, if you look at the federal government and what it's done where it has authority, and you know, you're FTA, but FRA, it has a horrible record, I mean, uh, of, of, of safety oversight. Um, not that you'll be a failure, and we don't want you to be a failure, we want you to be a success, but you had a failure of, uh, of an agency to organize uh, when you don't have uh, personnel assigned to safety, when you don't have a phone number, a website, uh, or, or specific responsibilities defined in something we have oversight uh, of, and we, our committee does over the district and uh, over this system, there's something wrong. So that needs to be changed. Uh, if other state agencies don't do that, and our recommendation was to reform existing state oversight program to ensure that state agencies are properly staffed and have necessary authority 
to oversee safety of local and state systems. Rather than have the money to create a federal bureaucracy, give them the resources. And you just got through saying it's a conflict for the agency to use their resources to, the, uh, to, to do the regulation. So I would rather go in the direction, if, you're, if we're going to set some standards, and we don't know what they'll be. The standards are going to be dramatically different. The L in Chicago is different than San Francisco, which you mentioned, which has cable car. We have, uh, we have um, BARDA system, uh, different technologies. So one size fits, fits all is not the answer to, to our problem, right? We agree. Absolutely. Okay. So again, it's, I don't, and I don't mind spending the resources on safety. So I think we've got to, you're well intended, you want to, you said uh, the mandates would be limited to safety management systems. Did, did I? Well, I don't want to say exclusively, that is our focus. I, yeah. I can't, you know, uh, something like, as well, I said. Well, again, we make certain that something's in place and somebody's doing something, whether it's a, uh, the two states in the District of Columbia here the, or uh, Something that's Illinois appropriate for the unique circumstances of that system. Or a regional system. We're now getting into regional systems. So I just don't want to spend a lot of money creating another federal bureaucracy with a lot of mandates. And then the other thing, too, is we said provide additional funding to local transit systems to upgrade safety equipment. That was our second recommendation back in November. So take some of the money, like Ms. Norton said, or these aging systems. They're all aging systems. Uh, uh, and they need the money and, and, and pinpoint that towards safety uh, equipment that can make a difference in true safety. So. I'm with you in the intent, but I, I just I think that we could we could if we work together we could refine this, and address the problems, and then have a, a solution that will uh, will yeah. will will do the job. M Mr. Mike, I I think we may disagree less than it appears, and and here's why. And you know you don't want to spend a lot of money on a large new bureaucracy. That is in part what we are saying when when we say we don't want to completely re recreate the FRA. Um, and that is not to denigrate the FRA, but they, they grew out of a very different tradition over, over not decades, but almost a century of, of, of trying to regulate uh, what started as, as, as rail operations run by, by private railroads. Um, you know, we have put forward money for additional people, not only so we could do regulations, but also to do the very issues like fund strengthening of state safety oversight organizations to give them the training and the expertise so we could certify that they are safe and they, they are fully empowered to do a good job. Our budget proposal for this, which is you know, funded in the President's 2011 budget, is still west, well less than 1% of my agency's entire budget. And I don't foresee our overall budget, even in, in its fully built out form, exceeding 1% of our agency's total budget. And I'd also point out on the issue of, of, of the aging infrastructure, we're totally in agreement. We did a report, as you know, that identified some $50 billion in deferred maintenance at the seven largest rail transit systems. In our 2011 budget, a transit budget that only grows by 1% for the whole FTA, we found a way of funding the, safety, the new safety responsibilities, and we provided an 8% for our state of good repair initiative for these rail systems. So we are putting our money where our mouth is on looking out for safety and trying to do as well as we can on state of good repair. Well, maybe we again. can get an, an, an agreement here. Yeah. Me, well, we do, uh, we do thank him. We'll look forward to working with him. I'd ask unanimous consent that both a copy of our recommendations, the minority that uh, were prepared in December, be made part of the record, and also the chart that I referred to on the safety record uh, of the various agencies that was displayed before the committee be made part of the record. Without objection. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Could I, could I just add one thing, and this is not to create dissonance where there may be some harmony, but uh, there is some data points. I, th I think it's important in the, considering the context of Mr. Micah's um, uh, statistics. It's important to point out thankfully, there are few enough fatal accidents in either of these modes that one accident skews the data rather dramatically. So that went up through, that, 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 mon that, th that data did not take in the metro accident. There's all kinds of ways of cutting this data on whether you can include right-of-way accidents or not. We have some data that concerns us greatly, like a 65% increase in derailments. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. If, if you could, I, I, I want you to be able to make that point. I'll, if you can I'll make summarize it, it for the record, if the, you like. That, that would be very Absolutely. helpful, just because we have other members. Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your earlier kind remarks. Um, and thank you, Mr. Rogoff, for your testimony and for this uh, very thoughtful audit, which uh, I think is uh, 